Thank you very much, and good afternoon. And it's uh, really a pleasure to be here. And uh, I think this um, is a great opportunity to talk about our coastal resources. Thank you, and how best to protect American communities from the impacts of a changing climate. As you just, as you just heard, and we appreciate all the work uh, that the Association of State Floodplain Managers are are doing uh, on this, and uh, very uh, a number of other very important uh, subjects around this. And I, I really. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk to you a little bit this afternoon about uh, some of the ways that the Obama administration is um, is engaging on these issues. And uh, as you know very well, and as the president uh, reiterated in his State of the Union address, uh, the health of our environment has very important and deep implications for the health of our economy and our communities. And believe we believe very strongly that those two things uh, go hand in hand. Uh, so to address the uh, economic, security, and environmental threats that are posed by climate change, we must curb carbon emissions that are intensifying the problem and improve our ability to manage uh, the impacts of climate change that were already being uh, felt here at home. And, and that's why the President um, has as part of his uh, all of the above approach to American energy has taken historic action uh, to curb pollution in American communities to reduce our dependence on foreign oil and support the growth of sustainable clean energy jobs and industries. And we've made unprecedented investments in clean energy and met uh, and already met the goal that the president laid out in 2008 to double renewable energy generation in this country. And so to build on the progress that we've already made, the President laid out another goal in the State of the Union address to once again double generation from wind, solar, and geothermal sources uh, by the year 2020. We, uh, we took another groundbreaking step in reducing our greenhouse gas emissions last summer when we finalized historic fuel economy standards uh, that will double the distance that our cars uh, go on a gallon of gas, and these new standards will save Americans trillions of dollars at the pump and, and, and eliminate six billion metric tons of carbon pollution. And that's more than the entire um, amount of uh, carbon dioxide that was emitted in the United States in, in the year 2010. So that's a few examples of the progress that we're making uh, to, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to, to mitigate uh, climate change, uh, and uh, and we know we need to do we need to do more. Uh, the president in the State of the Union called on Congress uh, to put forward a bipartisan market-based solution to combat climate change, and he also directed his cabinet to look at further steps uh, that we could take to reduce pollution. To, and importantly, I think to well to transition to a, to more sustainable sources of energy, and and important for this discussion to prepare our communities for the impacts of climate change. So as we're moving forward on actions to um, cut carbon pollution and to grow sustainable energy industries, we're also taking actions to prepare for the impacts of climate change that we're already seeing, including more frequent and severe um, extreme weather. And that's, it's true that uh, no single event makes a trend, but we know that 12 of the hottest years on record have all come in the last 15 years. And in 2011, the United States experienced a record uh, 14 extreme weather events that caused each caused more than $1 billion in damages. And the total economic damages uh, from that year exceeded $55 billion. In, t in 2012, as you know, we, we saw uh, record-breaking heat. Uh, a drought that affected more than half of the country, and super, uh, Superstorm Sandy, which alone has caused an estimated $50 billion in damage. Uh, the science uh, around climate change shows that heat waves and droughts and wildfires and floods, uh, while we we're experience them um, every year uh, in different parts of the country, that they will become uh, more frequent and more intense. Uh, last week, the Government Accountability Office, which is a nonpartisan um, congressional watchdog, uh, put climate change as a high-risk financial issue for the federal government. The federal government, as you know, owns extensive infrastructure, including uh, defense installations, 
ensures, ensures property and provides emergency aid in the response uh, to natural disasters. So even just as a good a fiscal matter, uh, um, a matter of good fiscal management, addressing climate change is critical uh, for agencies uh, to continue to serve the public well. So from the, from the early days of, this, of his administration, the president's directed federal agencies to take actions to prepare, prepare for these kinds of impacts. There's a science element to this. The U.S. Global Change Research Program is in the midst of its updating its national climate assessment, really focusing on impacts. And in October of 2009, the president signed an executive order uh, on sustainability in the federal government that asked an interagency group, an interagency task force, to develop recommendations about how federal policies and programs can better prepare the U.S. to respond to a changing climate. And this uh, task force has put forward a number of important recommendations that we're carrying out now, including making sure that the science information about climate impacts is easily accessible to the people uh, who need it on the ground. And also at the direction of the president, the federal agencies this month took a very important step uh, forward on, on preparedness for dealing with the impacts of climate change. Uh, when we released the first time we've ever done this, uh, climate change adaptation plans. And these plans uh, for each of these agencies integrate adaptation uh, planning into the, into the operations, the policies, and the programs of federal agencies. So for example, the Department of Transportation's plan describes how impacts like flooding uh, will impact the transportation sector and notes that the Federal Highway Administration uh, is working on, uh, will work on developing guide guidance for incorporating climate change considerations into the planning and design of projects in coastal areas. The Department of Homeland Security is looking at the challenges of preparing for and responding uh, to extreme events. And also uh, things that are needed to ensure safety and stability in the Arctic, uh, which is becoming more and more accessible uh, uh, in a warming climate. And also planning uh, for changing conditions along our nation's borders. The Department of Agriculture in its plan noted that climate change has the potential to impede its efforts to meet uh, its core obligations from expanding economic opportunities to building a thriving rural America. And they're laying out steps to ensure that a changing climate won't disrupt their capacity to serve the American people. And I'll give you one final example. In uh, EPA, in their plan, they identified uh, potential climate risks related to both air quality and the availability and quality of water resources. They're conducting uh, regional assessments to identify areas of greatest needs, including identifying the most vulnerable populations and developing plans to address these priorities. So now that this first round of plans is out, uh, the work doesn't stop there. The federal agencies uh, will update these plans uh, moving forward, and we'll be working to try to address uh, many of the common challenges that were identified across agencies, and that includes uh, the need to provide better and more locally relevant information on climate change impacts, the need to ensure that federal programs support adaptation efforts at the local level, and the need to better integrate climate <coughs> considerations into planning and investment decisions to ensure they're viable over the long term and the need to protect federal facilities and personnel from extreme events and other impacts. So there's a lot of work underway at, at each of these agencies, and I'll give you a few examples. Uh, the Department of Agriculture recently released two comprehensive reports that synthesize the science of climate change effects and adaptation strategies for U.S. agriculture and for forests, and uh, will help to uh, help local decision makers to identify the risks that they should plan for. Uh, NOAA is, uh, and, and some of its other partners are working with the cities of Toledo, Ohio, and Duluth, Minnesota on an economic study that's focused on assessing predicted rainfall, uh, the impacts it may have on the communities, on these communities and options for reducing flooding from extreme events. And the Centers uh, for Disease Control, the Department of Homeland Security, NOAA, and EPA 
have developed an excessive heat event guidebook to help uh, community officials, emergency managers, and scientists to develop uh, city-specific heat response plans and early warning systems. And we're putting some of this, uh, all, all of this uh, planning that the agencies are doing to work, for example, in the interagency Sandy Recovery Task Force uh, that's being led by uh, Sean Donovan, the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, to really think about how uh, we incorporate resilience uh, into this recovery effort. And we recognize that most of this adaptation work will occur at the local level where uh, state and local governments and the private sector and stakeholders all play a crucial role in assuring uh, that we are prepared. Uh, communities across the country are already taking steps to protect themselves and to invest in less lasting and resilient infrastructure. And the federal government uh, has an important role to play and should uh, play an important role in supporting these efforts and ensuring uh, they have what they need to be successful. So, uh, as I said in the State of the Union address, uh, the President directed federal agencies to take actions to support communities as they prepare for a changing climate. Then this is going to mean going forward uh, forging new partnerships with uh, state and local governments to improve preparedness and, and resiliency for our, uh, for our communities, and also to ensure that our taxpayer dollars are used efficiently to promote stronger, uh, safer, and more resilient communities. And that, of course, means uh, working with, with folks like you, with leaders like you, who are really um, deeply involved in managing uh, impacts um, in our coastal areas. And we, part of the way I think we need to support the work that you all are doing is to, is to try to break down uh, the silos between uh, federal agencies, which I'm sure you've never experienced. Um, updating federal policies, uh, as was just talked about, and, and giving uh, communities and government leaders uh, more tools uh, to understand, avoid, uh, and mitigate flood risk. You know, our coastal areas, as you all know, are home to, home to millions of Americans or represent a significant portion of our economy and, and provide important environmental security, trade, a whole bunch of other benefits to our country. And so uh, we want to recognize uh, how we can help to embrace innovative uh, projects uh, in these coastal areas that rely less on, on uh, hard infrastructure and more on softer or non-structural components that can withstand major coastal flooding and storm events. The severe weather events and rising sea levels place our uh, coastal floodplains at increased risk. Smart storm protection projects can uh, greatly reduce flooding uh, and damage in the communities. And uh, when, uh, certainly, uh, as you all know, when a major flooding event occurs in one region, it can be felt across the nation, uh, as we saw recently uh, with Superstorm Sandy. Uh, Post-storm damage surveys suggest that areas with coastal protection projects suffer, suffered less damage than in other areas, uh, saving millions of dollars. But traditionally, as you know, projects uh, that are damaged are rebuilt to their initial condition uh, rather than updated to withstand a changing climate and making them vulnerable, therefore, to further damage. And, and we need to focus on resiliency and sustainability when we plan for, uh, for uh, restoration and, and uh, when we plan, whether it's for restoration and not just uh, during, uh, during a recovery. And um, it is sort of interesting in, um, in, in our world, mitigation means reducing greenhouse gas <laughs> emissions and mitigation in the, in the disaster uh, context means something else. And, um, it's led to some very interesting discussions <laughs> of the, you know, people talking past each other until they figured out they were talking about the same thing but calling it different things. Um, we are also, you know, working to update the 30-year-old criteria that uh, guide how our, our nation makes major investments in water projects and how we value uh, the role of resources such as uh, floodplains for storm protection. Now, these new principles and guidelines uh, will give communities more tools uh, to deploy the most uh, current and up-to-date water management strategies 
uh, will take a more comprehensive approach to water projects that consider their benefits for economic development, for recreation, for the environment. And the goal here is to ensure uh, responsible um, taxpayer investment through uh, smarter front end planning uh, so that projects can, uh, can move faster, stay on budget, and uh, perform better uh, over, over the long term. And uh, we hope to have uh, some news on, on the principles and guidelines soon. And we've also been working, uh, not just uh, EPA, but a number of other agencies looking at uh, how we can incorporate green infrastructure in, into the work uh, that many of these agencies do. Uh, federal agencies are, are also working together to standardize and to share data that can help local communities prevent flooding and improve uh, stewardship of floodplains and other land and water resources. And, uh, the Federal Interagency Flood Plain Management Task Force uh, that's co-chaired by FEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers is identifying and developing opportunities uh, to promote better coastal floodplain management. Uh, so that's a, a broad overview of uh, some of the things that are going on on the federal side. Um, and I think it, it, uh, uh, it is worth saying that uh, the kind of work that you all are doing, and uh, hopefully uh, we are good partners with you, will we'll help to promote stronger and healthier uh, American communities. It's going to require us to uh, to work together. It will require uh, innovation uh, and creativity. And I, I know that um, you all do this work uh, each and every day. And so we thank you for your, your leadership. We thank you for um, being our partners, and we look forward to, uh, to continuing to work with you for a healthy and prosperous America. Thanks very much.